Welcome to Too Deep, Hokies Under the Influence. My name is Pete Berthold, and you'll notice I don't have my typical co-host here today, but I do have Sam Jesse from formerly of the Locks Pod, from Behind Enemy Lines, and the head of our website over at Sons of Saturday. Sam, how you doing? I'm doing good. I can never, can never replace Robbie. It is kind of weird <laughs> being on here. I started listening to you guys when I was an undergrad. That's how long, <laughs> that's how long you've been doing this. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to be on here. Yeah, I wear a lot of hats with Sons of Saturday, but uh, this is maybe one that I'm most excited about right now. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get Sam more and more involved as, as Robbie kind of takes a step back over the offseason, and then we'll kind of revisit uh, how the podcast goes as we move over the summer and everything. Rob is not completely gone, but for right now, you're going to get me and Sam doing some episodes for you this winter and into the spring. I wanted to say, uh, see if you could fill Robbie's shoes with a cheer, Sam. I kind of didn't prepare you for this, but it can be Ooh. quick and off the top of your head. You know, I think my cheers is this is the first Virginia Tech offseason in, you know, I think, probably since in between 2016, 2017, where we're feeling good about things. Um, so cheers to being excited about football in Blacksburg. Cheers to that. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a it's been six or seven years since we've had an offseason <laughs> like this. I'm trying to think of when we were maybe telling ourselves we'd have a better season than we thought. And we could go back to the 2020 season prior to COVID wrecking everything. We were very excited about the Penn state game. We were very mm -hmm. excited about the potential of Hendon hooker and Herbert coming in and all that stuff. So I would say our January of 2020 <laughs> before we knew the world was about to change, we were excited. We, cause 2019 had been a good year. Yeah, and you know what? I actually I might even take back my 2016 to 2017. The defense stayed pretty continuous, but you were also replacing Gerard Evans at quarterback and two of your top three pass catchers in in Ford and Hodges. So this is, dare I say, a bit unprecedented in in yeah. Blacksburg since the Beamer years. I, I would say. And you've been all over that. You've been talking a lot about how. When was the last time we? kept all the key guys because it really has been it's been a while because even 2016 it was a good season but going into that year we had a new quarterback coming in a lot of holdovers at the skill positions and some of the o-line but it was a very much an unknown mm -hmm. especially with yeah. the new coach <laughs> that needless to say and you know what don't take this offseason for granted because there's very very few programs that are retaining a roster like virginia tech is this offseason so I think it's important to recognize that as we go into spring ball here. And that'll kind of segue into our, our news and notes, because I think Doug Bowman just put out an article talking about the returning production. He kind of calculated it on his own based on what Bill Connolly normally does. And he essentially said, we're going to be bringing back over 80% of our production. I think it was around 83% or something. Uh, is that what you're looking up right now? I, I was I was looking up a little bit of it. I was seeing if I could find his actual tweet, but uh, I'm very excited for Tarp to come out this this <laughs> yeah. summer. That's going to be Tech is going to be up towards the top in that one. For those who don't know, Tarp is a metric uh, devised by some really smart people who partner with Action Network, and it stands for Transfer Asset and Returning Production. And it's a really fancy way to say how much production you return and you brought into the program and I'm is it the most important thing in the world? Like maybe not, but I'm just excited for tech to be highly ranked in something. Yeah, it, it's cool. And I think what what Doug's gist was, if you take into account what we should be bringing back, it adds X amount of points to your SP plus score, which would maybe vault us it into the top 25 in SP plus, which is mm -hmm. would be pretty crazy to be that high after where we were just just two years ago. You'll also notice behind me, there's a new sign and this was a birthday gift from my wife. And so thank you. Thank you, Kate, for the, for the gift, but the neon sign with the two deep in the background, if you are listening and not watching on YouTube, pop over to YouTube. It's, it's very cool. And I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, the podcast isn't going to funk since I just got this. sign. <laughs> We're going to be, uh, be ready for the 10th season coming up here. Uh, and it's got all kinds of modes too. So maybe when like the hot, we get a hot take or something, you know, you flash those lights cause it gets, it gets hella bright. Like well, we were talking bright. about this. Uh... 
Oh wait, you what? You just muted yourself. <laughs> I just muted. <laughs> yeah. So the fun fact: the uh, button that changes the colors on the microphone is also the mute button. Um, so yeah, I won't, Sam's got himself a new toy over there as well. I won't hurt people's eyes with the flashing lights, but if I need a hot take, maybe this is my hot take button. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. Work. Yeah, that's even better. Right on the microphone there. But yeah, Sam, you sound good. And uh, we're ready to get into this podcast. We're going to get the, the meat and potatoes of this thing is going to be the ACC schedule reaction. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, I just wanted to go over kind of what's happening in college football, our roster update, and some basketball updates for you guys. Michigan won it all. We did our national live stream. A, a lot of people tuned in. It's three different parts have been posted to the podcast feed. So you should have heard it. And I thought a lot of it came out really good. But now we just got the news today. Harbaugh is going to the Chargers. And that was been rumored for a couple of days. Saban retired about a week and a half ago. DeBoer from Washington was hired in his place. The coaching carousel spinning yet again, Sam. Is there anything notable that you saw over these last couple of weeks besides um, those things? <laughs> other other than the best coach of all time and a one of the better football coaches alive moving and one of the winningest coaches we've ever seen moving other than that not much um <laughs> yeah. i think it's actually considering that those things happened other than that i think the storylines are the people who stayed in place right Dabo sweeney stayed at clemson um Damn he like. was the heir apparent he stayed at clemson mike norvell stayed at florida state steve Sark sarkeesian stayed at texas you know so those are some big programs that were able and to they were trying to get landing out of oregon too right like that was or that was a big Dan, one. Dan Lanning might have more money than God right now in, <laughs> in some very underground channels. Uh, I think he's going to be in Eugene for quite some time. You know what's interesting about them moving into the Big Ten this year is that with Harbaugh getting hired away, I, I'm assuming Sharon Moore is going to take over that program. It's not, a, it's not a sure thing, but that's what I've been assuming. I, I think so. You'd have to think. Yeah, but... Does this put Oregon firmly in the number two spot in the Big Ten? I mean, roster wise, maybe number, number one. two. <laughs> um, I mean, they certainly have the best quarterback. I would say they have a really distinct home field advantage with how far teams are going to have to travel to play them. I think they return a lot of pieces on defense. They will have to replace, I mean, your starting quarterback, your best wide receiver, and your starting running back is never yeah. fun. But this is a, a program that is never short on talent. So I think bringing in Dylan Gabriel, keeping that coaching staff intact, keeping that defense, they are, they're in the national title conversation again. There, there's no yeah. doubt. Yeah. And Ohio state has been loading up. So that's why I assume that they will be number one in the big 10. I mean, getting Caleb downs out of Alabama, uh, is just so critical and, and amazing. Cause that is one of the best portal entries we've seen since the portal came into place like he he's a, a stud they're on all-time defense watch i think if you look at what they've built it's better i think you know that first national title georgia team was pretty special in terms of the nfl yeah. talent 15 this graphics. team is up there like this this team all starting 11 are probably nfl contributors at minimum so it, it's going to be a wild season yeah. And 15 draft picks for Georgia that year was both sides of the ball, but there were, there was a lot that were mostly on defense on defense. Uh, I did note that Jed fish got hired to replace DeBoer at Washington. And then I think you commented on Twitter about, is it San Jose state's head coach got tapped mm -hmm. to be the Arizona guy? Yes. But yes. Then the Arizona subsequently fired their AD like two days later. Well, in bigger news, the university of Arizona might be, their athletic department, at least horribly, horribly bankrupt. Mm. And that is part of the reason. So this is a program that has hired Kevin Sumlin when he was one of the biggest names in college football at Texas A&M. They hired Rich Rodriguez, who has always been a big name. So doing all of that and then, and then hiring San Jose's coach. And I feel terrible because I'm the mountain West guy and his name yeah. is escaping me, right? It's now. like Br Bramble or something. I, I, I can't think of it off Brennan. the top of my head. Either. Brennan. Yeah. But he's yeah. he's a high quality coach, and honestly, he might be a better fit than either of those guys that you named that came at much higher price tags. Uh, and it, it was a, I think 
I think cover three might have called it a Walmart hire or something like that because you yeah. know they're trying to save some money. <laughs> I mean, he's a good football coach. And think about and uh, most of our listeners know nothing about San Jose State football. And that's yeah, we'll move on okay. shortly, but go ahead. <laughs> but uh this is a program that had to do fundraisers just to be able to feed their players breakfast before practice. Oh god. They were that's doing like car wash fundraisers and percentage nights at Chipotle. To fund. Was that in like a recent piece that just came out or something? I didn't mm-hmm. hear that. I mean, oh, this is God. when their new basketball coach a few years ago had to like out of his own pocket, had to buy like 50 basketballs because they only had like one rack of basketballs for the program. It's it's crazy. So if he can go to bowl games there, uh, he's a phenomenal coach. Piggybacking on the Bama news was just the fact that how many of their transfers have gone out the door. And in, according to On3, who puts together the composite of the transfers who left and the transfers who came in, Alabama is dead last in the composite score of their of their transfers because so many of the guys that are leaving were highly recruited guys. That number will come up as they bring in more Washington guys and and bring in players from, from around the, uh, the country as spring practice gets moving and after spring practice and whatnot. Second to last is Washington. And you'll notice that those two teams are connected. And then behind that was Oregon State, Arizona, and Georgia, all for different reasons that they are struggling in the transfer department. For Georgia, it's kind of like they're just kicking out the guys that didn't hit in their recruiting classes, right? And they're just mm-hmm. bringing in new guys to test out. It's no no one of super substance, maybe then one or two players. And the guy who kind of started that when the transfer portal first started was Nick Saban. He was the guy who started treating it like an NFL roster and saying, I can't kick you off the team, but I can tell you to your face that you're never going to play here. Yeah. And you feel like Georgia is at that level where they, we, we talk about like trimming the fat, feel like they are, they're, they're going in with a scalpel, very carefully picking and choosing their roster. And um, it's, that's it's, the kind of stuff special. that wasn't happening five years ago. You know, you, if oh. you got stuck with a bad four star or in their case, a bad, bad five star who just wasn't, didn't live up to his recruiting ranking. He would stay on the roster like uh Deshaun hand at Alabama, a guy that tech really wanted back in the day. He goes to Alabama. You never really heard much about him. He didn't really play. He didn't, he didn't hit. He was, I think that one of the number one recruits in the country at one point during his recruiting. And so years ago, he would have left after year one or year two. And, or, or I'm sorry, if he was here now, that's what he would have done years ago. You didn't do that. And so it's interesting, like in some ways, the talent's getting more spread out, but in other ways, Georgia can trim out the guys who didn't hit and just bring in more talent. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a double-edged sword for sure. All right. Roster update for the Hokies. We'll do, we'll do Hokie stuff from here on out. Clayton Frady is no longer with the team. The offensive lineman who came in last year from Gardner Webb, uh, that was not a hit. Uh, he, we were hoping that he might be a, a starter or at least get a lot of snaps for us, and he really didn't contribute at all. So um, he's he's no longer with the team, and we'll get that scholarship back. Keonta Jenkins is coming back for yet another season, our star linebacker. And I don't mean star in the sense of how good he is, although he is good. I mean in terms of his position. He plays that kind of whip safety hybrid at the star position and he was good last year and it was someone me and you talked about on college football monday several weeks ago when we had rob irby on that we've really wanted back and i'm excited about it dude i think it really helps our defense i remember covering him when he was a recruit out of jacksonville and he wasn't super highly recruited but the programs who were recruiting him felt like they had someone good he is really good he's I would say probably the best tackler on the defense. Um, He adds a bit of, he's got that like nasty dog to him. Like he's not the fastest guy. He's not the, you know, most physical freak, although he is very big. He just, when he hits you, you're going backwards. And I think he's a really important part to this defense. Him and Jalen Stroman staying healthy and playing 11, hopefully 12 games. That's like a free agent ad for Virginia Tech. Yeah, and that's what I just wrote down on my sheet. Is like if he stays healthy, because this year he battled injuries a lot of the season, along with all the rest of our safeties. And there was a little bit of talk about him potentially moving to safety and whether that's mm-hmm. going to take place or not. We have 
uh, reddish coming in. And mm-hmm. the other guys at safety were pretty green last year in terms of most Phillips, who's a true freshman. And then Jones who got moved over there. So I don't know what exactly they're going to do with Jenkins, but just having him at either position is going to be huge. I'm going to guess that they're going to try to keep him closer to the line of scrimmage and seeing how important that safety position was. I don't think they're going to mess around with any more position changes and putting them back at safety. I, I think you're going to see going forward, guys are going to get recruited to play safety and they're going to play safety. They're, they're not going to mess around. It bit him in the butt last year too many times. And it bit us in the butt at linebacker too, because a couple of our linebackers were recruited or played safety in high school. And hopefully we kind of, like you said, kind of eliminate that kind of thing. We can keep guys in the same place. Uh, I did want to talk about the January enrollees quickly. All mm-hmm. four transfers are enrolled, plus Copeland, who I'm, I'm not classifying as a transfer. He was Juco, but whatever. So all five of those guys and then nine high school players as well are all enrolled for January. So that leaves only six that aren't here yet, which is which is pretty cool. So mm-hmm. all of these guys are going to get uh, snaps in the spring, and we can kind of see what they're made of and if any will contribute next season. And here's the list of the, of the freshmen that are coming in, Sam. It's – Gabe Williams, Keelan Adams, uh, wide receiver Wiggins, defensive end uh, Johnson, Hanchuk, uh, running back Tyler Mason, Joshua Clark at corner, Derek Dandy at defensive end, and Reddish at safety. There's a couple of these guys that I think are going to not take a red shirt and they're going to play next year and, and mm-hmm. maybe even be valuable. I would be curious, and I know I kind of ran those names off quickly, but I'm sure you're familiar with them. Of those like nine early enrollees, who do you think could have the best chance of playing significant snaps for us next year? You know, I think the best player is probably Keelan Adams, just his natural athleticism, but he doesn't really have a path to the field this year. Him and James Wiggins both are very good. They don't really have a path, but I I don't think they came here expecting to play highly as freshmen. So I, I don't think that'll be an issue. Williams is a guy who they need to get better at linebacker. I I know tech played well the last few games, but the linebacker position was the worst on the field. Most of the season. Mm -hmm. If he can come in there and make some sort of impact, I think he can at least get on the field. I would say the same for reddish because everyone in front of him on the depth chart has a history of injuries. They might need Quentin reddish to, to get out there and play some, play some minutes because, uh, Stroman's had injury troubles. You, you lose Nasir Peoples to graduation. You have Jalen Jones, who was up and down at best. You have like maybe a convert, like maybe you put Mansoor Delane back there. I don't know. Right. So he, he might need to play some minutes here. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you on all three of those guys. And you're right. You go down the positions of need and where we kind of struggled last year. Cameron Fleming was another safety name, but he was a true freshman last year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, the, it's it's thin. Devin Alves, like uh, I think he was a uh, he was another position at one point, but now he's potentially a safety. Um, but either way, it's uh, reddish. I especially with the way his recruitment ended and uh, people trying to come in after him, like Ohio State. There's a lot of potential there. If our wide receiver room was any less deep, I would give Keelan Adams like number one ranking for sure as who's going to contribute next year. Uh, but it's just, it's going to be harder to get ca- catches with Gus Snell's injury. Maybe that opens a little bit of a door, but you still got Aiden green there too. That, mm-hmm. and that was able to get on the field this year. So uh, love where the wide receiver room is headed, but Gabe Williams, I am very excited about, and he is going to have every opportunity to play early. He's got to, he's got to add some beef. He's a little, he's, he's a, and I don't mean that like, he's not a weight room guy. You yeah. see him on social media in the weight room all the time. He's just very lanky. And he's, he's tall, long, like, I think he does need to probably physicality is going to be an issue early, which it is for most freshmen coming in. If he can deal with the physicality this spring and in fall camp, uh, Hey, throw him out there, man, because he's a talented, talented player. Have you noticed the upgrades in some of our recruiting rankings over the last week? I think there was three or four guys that moved up from like an 87 to an 88. I think Hanchuk was one. He's an 88 now. I think Laws moved up after his performance at that uh, at that camp. And then I think Wiggins might have moved up as well. And so 
Now our average recruit ranking on the 247 composite is an 88 for all of the, it's like 88 point something, um, which is fourth highest in the ACC. It's Miami, FSU, Clemson, Virginia Tech. And keep in mind, that's 17 teams now. And so that's only 16 players, but the average recruit of any of the class is number four in the ACC. I am ecstatic to see that. I'm just clicking it right now to, to see so I can kind of update myself. Uh, first off, uh, Andrew Hanchuk, Cleveland, Ohio guy. Give me all the Northeast Ohio players. Him. And he was the lowest rated composite guy in the class. And now he's an 88 on the 247 in-house. And I have to mention Hudson, Ohio's own. Roll HUD, uh, Tommy Ricard, another interior offensive lineman, defensive lineman guy. Um, I think the biggest thing I'm noticing with the guys that are bringing in, not only in recruiting, but from the transfer portal is guys who are physically like bigger, faster, stronger than what we have seen in the past five or six years. Have, did you see the picture of uh, Kevin Gilliam? Yes. On, yes. It's, he looks like a pickup truck. It's insane. Like we He's haven't huge. had guys like that since like Tim Settle, uh, a Tremaine Edmonds, obviously, but like, man, it's, that's, it feels that's, good because even the guys who aren't super highly rated, you're like, whoa, that's a, that's a football player. And that's the thing. I mean, Gilliam, we know that maybe that was a guy that didn't live up to his recruiting ranking. And that's why he's leaving Oklahoma to maybe come home or get some more playing time or whatever his reasoning may be. But there was a reason that he was that highly ranked and it's because he's a monster physically and they just don't make <laughs> that many of those guys in this world. There just aren't that many. And so it's, it's a nice to have him athlete. in the fold. <laughs> and Andrew with our, is list Oh, sorry. Andrew Hantrick is listed at 6'5", 285. And is he listed? Lineman. Yeah, is he going to play D-line or O-line? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. I, I don't think know. he's going to play. I think he's going to play what they need him to play. I'll, yeah, I'll put it right. that way. All right. The 2024 class just went over that and how we're, our ranking has moved up. So I think we're going to move on to hoops now, and then we'll come back to football when we get to the schedule stuff. Let's go over the men's hoops update. And you just wrote an article kind of recapping the first half of the season, which I think you put out that article right before the BC game. Was it mm -hmm. after NC yeah. State? Right, right in between NC State and BC games. Yep. Okay. And after losing four of five with the only win being that Clemson game, which was a really good win, the Hokies mm -hmm. have now won two straight. The NC State game on the road and the BC game at home. And both of those wins were huge for – very different reasons. One, we thought NC State was a Q1 win when we got it, and it was for a moment. And then it wasn't because us beating them kind of knocked them back, although I think there is still hope uh, for them being a, a Q1 win at the end of the year. In your midseason report, what kind of stood out to you as like why the team was maybe struggling a bit uh, during that first section of ACC play? You know, I think they had too many players, one, not playing up to their potential, and two, they were figuring things out on the fly, it, it felt like. And it's hard to really get a sense of what your issues are when you're playing American and Coppin State and, and those teams, Valpo, Vermont, even though Vermont has, has won a few games. It's just tough. You really don't figure that out until ACC play. And you, unfortunately for Virginia Tech, they... You know, obviously the Rodney Rice loss is was pretty big. Mm -hmm. Then you, you know, Mikai Long and Robbie Barron have come in and have had some good moments, but have also been a little bit invisible at times. And when you bring in two seniors from major college basketball into your program to be your sixth and seventh guys off the bench or starters, you got to get something from them. And Tech just yeah. hasn't. Uh, MJ Collins was ice cold to start the season, but he's looking a bit better. Uh, like Lynn Kidd looked really good in non-conference, sh has struggled to score as much, although I thought he played pretty well defensively uh, against BC. Like they just, too many guys weren't playing well, yeah. but they were really close. And, and you feel like that NC State game might have been the game where they kind of figured it out because I thought they played very well offensively in that game. I thought they played very well offensively against Boston College down 
uh, the aforementioned Makai Long, also down Rex Steiner. So they're playing with pretty much seven players. So that's true. Yeah. I'll tell you this, this team is, I've said the line all year. They are very close to being very good. Can they get over the hump though? That's, that's the question because outside of one week in Brooklyn, they haven't been a, this, this roster construction hasn't been able to get over the hump yet. Yeah. They're very close to being very good. And their resume is very close to being mm-hmm. very good because we've got that Boise state win. We've got the NC state win and we've got, what was the third one? That's right on the cusp there. Um, Boise up Boise, Clemson, NC state because Clemson actually fell out of mm-hmm. Q1 because it was they're beyond 30 now. So they have to be top 30 because it was a home win. So if we get, cause our only Q1 win right now is Iowa state. If those three teams play a little bit better, we're all of a sudden going to be like launched up into a much better position from a Q1 win standpoint. But just from the team aspect, Couture led us in points in both the NC State game and in the uh, the game right or the game right after that, the BC game. And he's sh- been shooting like crazy from three. He's 13 of 22 from three over his last five games. Now, one of those games, he didn't record any stats because he got injured and left. But over he did play. So o- over the last five games, 13 of 22 is damn good from three. And Padula, he was like going nuclear there for a couple games. He had 33 and 10 against Miami. And the 10 was rebounds, not assists, which is which is pretty weird for him. And then after that against Clemson, he had 32 and seven assists. So he was playing really well, 26 in the FSU game. But then Hunter has come on the last two games and played. And I would agree with you on, on Beeren, or maybe I'm not sure exactly what you said about Beeren, but you mentioned him. And I think he has been playing better lately. He has. It, look, there are limitations to his game, but what he does well when he does it is he can stretch the floor. He can shoot some threes. He's a, I'll tell you what, he's getting a lot of crap, but he has made some clutch free throws this year. Ice in his veins type stuff. That's you. you that might be worth the it. end of the BC he game, right? He had a couple, a couple key ones. End of NC State, end of BC, end of uh, another game earlier this year. Like, really, I, Iowa State, I think it was. He's done the, that for him. The, well, the team as a whole is sixth in the country in free throw percentage. We're <laughs> hitting 79% of our free throws, which is awesome for a college team. And I did need to mention Nickel because he mm-hmm. had the 24 against Clemson, which really helped us win that game. 12 against NC State. He seems to be getting a little bit more comfortable as well. And if he could ever kind of like put it all together for multiple games in a row, he could be dangerous. He's shooting 39% from three, which is good, but I think he's capable of even more than that. Yeah. And the way Virginia tech plays, they play a relatively slow style of basketball. They limit possessions a bit. So when you have a lot of these shooters, even really good shooters like Tyler nickel and even Hunter Couture, they don't really have the volume numbers you would maybe expect them to have. So I feel like Nickel might not be a guy who's going to be able to drop 15 to 20 a game just because of the way Virginia Tech plays offense. Mm -hmm. But if he's a threat to shoot and he's also a threat to drive, that's just something that he can do that he hasn't shown too much of, but he has shown a little bit. uh, That could be really valuable for the Hokies because his his issue coming in, his issue at UNC was, hey, we don't think this guy can play college basketball defense. He's been pretty good defensively this year for Virginia Tech. So... Uh, I think they're feeling good right now. They have some momentum. Georgia Tech is not a very good team. So Mm -hmm. I think they might be on a three-game win streak with Duke coming into town, and that would be a massive, massive game. Yeah, the spacing, because of Hunter getting his shot back, Beeren shooting better. Beeren's 8 of 15 from three over the last five games, and Nickel shooting better. You saw some of the effect of that spacing against BC. And so with a 12 and 7 record now after that win, 4 and 4 in the ACC, we sit at 50th in the net right on that spot giving teams uh potentially some <laughs> some good neutral wins there for them. 59th in the Ken Palm, but like I said, the 1 and 5 against Q1. We're rooting for Boise, we're rooting for Clemson, we're rooting for NC State. Our Q1 opportunities going forward, Duke at home, surefire mm-hmm. Q1 opportunity. Uh, Miami away, but we could end up knocking them down if we were to beat them. UNC away is a lock for a Q1 opportunity, and then Pitt away. So you'll notice we only have one really good home chance at a Q1 win, 
and it's against Duke. Yeah, and there's a lot of teams who are floating in that like really high Q2 range. Uh, you know, Syracuse is at 82 right now. NC State's at 77. Uh, we have Pittsburgh at 66, Miami at 65. A lot of teams floating right there that Tech will play. I think we get really caught up in the resume stuff. I love it. I think it's really yeah, fun. I love it too. <laughs> Just win the game. Like if Virginia Tech wins the games they're supposed to win from here on out, I'm not talking mm-hmm. about UVA, Duke, Carolina. I'm not talking about those teams. Win the games they're supposed to win. This is a tournament team. They did their job in the non-conference. If they lose some of those games, if they drop to Georgia Tech, if they drop to Notre Dame later in the season, that's going to be the issue because yep. there simply aren't enough big time games in the ACC this season. There, there, there just aren't. The top of the conference isn't as good. There's essentially four teams at the bottom of the ACC that you just you can't lose to right now. Mm-hmm. Um, GT, Pitt, BC, and Notre Dame. And uh, hopefully we can pull off all those wins. But if you had to pick one team from the ACC to come to Castle and give you a chance at a Q1 win, what like Duke would be the choice. Historically, mm-hmm. we have played Duke well in the Castle. And so mm-hmm. I'm happy that that's, that's the opportunity we have. And it's a Duke team that lost to Georgia Tech and lost to Pittsburgh at home. Yep. They are not infallible. Um, no, I, they're beatable I think- for sure. I think Virginia Tech is, they're going to be licking their chops for that game. I, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am as well. And it's, we've reached that point now where we are like substantially separated from football season. And Tech just got a couple wins in basketball. And like the basketball team is coming into full focus. And, I, and I'm totally ready for it because I, I love Virginia Tech hoops. Let's move on to the women before we get to our beer break and to the schedule. The women are 14 and four five and two in the ACC and they're number 19 in this week's AP poll down five spots from last week after two straight losses to Florida state and Duke, but they did get back on track against Clemson. The biggest concern is the health of Georgia Amor as well as the health of Kayla King. And I, mm-hmm. I don't actually have a good update on either of those girls right now. So I think um, with Georgia, it, it definitely concussion. They are playing it safe as they should should be back pretty soon. I don't know if that'll be the next game or not, but they feel like she'll be back pretty soon. There shouldn't be any lasting effects. Kayla King, it looked really bad, but she was able to to walk back onto the court and not look too hobbled. Hopefully it was just a, a knee to knee contact on that collision that can, if, if that's happened to anyone, your, your leg just doesn't work. So of course you need <laughs> right. to get carried off. So hopefully it's something like that and nothing structural. I don't know about you, but it just feels like they haven't they haven't figured out one their their rotation, but two, they don't seem to have that dog in them this year that no. they had at the end of last year. And they need to kind of it seems like they need to find that. It's almost like Georgia and Liz are so good that and so mature and calm that they don't have that like underdog mentality anymore that's fueling them that I think they had last year in their tournament run. So I, if they get that, there are some really good, like Matilda Eck is really good and she hasn't been able to show it. Strzok is really good too. So I feel like Strzok hasn't even played like that many minutes yet. And I'm Mm -hmm. with you on pretty much everything you said there. Uh, And we made the final four. So sometimes maybe the hunger isn't isn't there hungry dogs run faster as uh jason kelsey once said but i do think once it becomes tournament time first of all kitley has been unbelievable this year it's her best year and and that's saying something because she's had incredible seasons she's averaging 22 and 11 (laughs) which which is absurd two assists a game and two blocks a game on top of that and so her and georgia can carry this team very far thinking back to last year's team and I, I'm, I will be perfectly honest. I was all in on that team once we got to the ACC tournament and into the tournament. I wasn't following the daily ins and outs of our women's basketball team last year. I'll put that that disclaimer out there. However, Eck to me seems like she might be a better third option than maybe the third option last year, which was what trailer or uh, Soul. Yeah, trailer, I, I don't trailer and Soul both. They're they're slightly different players. You. 
I think Soul gave them a bit of that, like she was a nice yin to George Amor's yang. George Amor's a very yeah. finesse driver. Soul was a power speed driver to the bucket. That's something that they've kind of missed this year. And I don't know if they're going to be able to find that on this current roster. Like, yeah, that's not Matilda. A player, will, <laughs> not a player will come out of thin air, but I think this is a better shooting team than last year. And if they can get hot, I with with Liz Kitley being the matchup nightmare she is, and George Amor's ability just to drop thirty on you at any moment. This this team has just as good of a shot to win the national title as last year's team because they could have beaten Iowa. They they had a couple minutes in the fourth quarter. They looked bad. They were on top of LSU and then went cold from three. Yeah. So, you know, I I this it's going to be the chemistry fun. gets fun. right. This team mm-hmm. could take off. And my 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 commentary on Eck might be more about an her offensively, uh, but she's a very good player as you pointed out. And mm-hmm. so we if we're if we're get hot shooting or whatever else yes this this team can be super good but i just i'm waiting for it all to click kind of like you were saying 18th in the net for uh for women's they don't they don't do quads for some reason i i don't know why they don't they do quads for the games in terms of quarters but they don't do quads in their net rankings i don't know i don't know why any of it's different from men to female but that that's different um yeah there are six more matchups for the women against ranked opponents this season six Mm -hmm. matchups against ranked opponents that's how good the acc is in the women's game and so only one of those is at home and that's unc on february 25th uh, and then I think their next game is they play an unranked Georgia Tech on Thursday before number 22 Syracuse in the Dome on Sunday. So those are the two games this week for the women. Uh, it's kind of, and I think a lot of people with the women's team, like they're paying attention because the two stars are back, but we're all waiting for March because mm-hmm. we got so far into March last year. We want to get back to that final four. Is this what like Kansas and UConn basketball <laughs> fans feel like? Right. Like the playoffs I, don't like the way how the Patriots were like the playoffs don't start till the AFC championship game. Is that what this is like? Yeah, I think that's what a lot of those teams like Kentucky and Kansas, they they bring in so many new guys every year that a lot of the beginning of the season is figuring out what your rotations are, what the chemistry mm-hmm. is. And then you need to be clicking by the end of conference play and into into March. I mean, look at what Michigan did in football. They didn't do anything spectacular against all that crap they played earlier in the year. And they just tuned up and tuned up and tuned up and then they won it all. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor and then we'll take our beer break. The 2d pokies under the influence podcast is brought to you by Roback. You guys know Roback. It's the performance activewear designed for those who crave activity. It's the same polo company. That brought you the Virginia Tech Berg polo. It brought you the maroon polo with the orange Virginias. And it also brought you the Commonwealth, which is, oh, that was the white one with the maroon Virginias. Um, the Berg was the quarter zip, mm-hmm. correct? Yes. And so they've got they've got tons of great gear, whether or not you want the Virginia Tech stuff or you just want to go check out their other styles because they have all kinds of fun polos and quarter zips on their site, as well as tees, shorts, joggers, women's stuff, tennis skirts. Um, and so you need to use code 2DEEPVT to get 20% off your order. It's the same code we've been telling you all year. If you want to get something on that code, maybe use a different email this time. I don't know. It's just a suggestion. But use code 2DEEPVT, load up your cart, and you'll get 20% off that order. Roback Crave Activity. Right now, Sam, I need to know what you're drinking. Well... Since this is a uh, one of the classic VT pods, I would say it can go into that category. I am drinking a classic beer, and it is none other than Allagash White from Allagash Ooh. Brewing Company up in Maine. Maine, by the way, the best state for beer in the country, hands down, uh, both scientifically and from, from me. Uh, if you haven't had Allagash White, it's fresh. It's a little citrusy. It's crisp. Um, it is a great, great beer and, uh, shout out to people at Allagash for making, I think one of the best craft beers in the country, uh, and one of the most widely distributed as well. And it's held up 
you know, that it flavor profile of Allagash White has been around a long time, but it has held up for, I don't know, 20 plus years. I don't know when Allagash White came out, but it's been a while. I'm. Have you ever been to the brewery, Sam? I'm assuming with this talk about Maine that you must have been I have there been, at some point. I have not. I've been to Maine Brewing Company, which okay. um, awesome. will be on Love. the show. Will <laughs> yeah. be on the show. Uh, I've been to a few others around Portland as well, but uh, man, they they do it right up. They know something up there, man. If you go to Allagash, at least when I went many years ago, it's probably about 2013 or something, but they just give you beer. At that time, you didn't even have to pay. They would just give you like a flight for free, which is pretty awesome. And I've been to a lot of breweries and not many do that. Uh, I went to Maine Beer Company last summer and then, you know, New, I think Massachusetts would give Maine a run for its money and, and maybe even Vermont. You know, I, I love my Vermont beers, but man, New mm-hmm. England's got a lot of good ones. Yeah. I am drinking Eyes of the World IPA. This is, my light is messing with it, but it is, it's got some funky art, kind of like a Dr. Seuss kind of thing going on there. And it's a New England style IPA, but it's from Pennsylvania. It's from Evergreen Brewing, Evergreen Brewing Company. And I got this from my brother-in-law, Camp Hill, PA. It's a little town outside of Harrisburg, right in the middle of the state. But this Eyes of the World New England IPA is phenomenal. And I don't think I've ever had Evergreen before, but I really like this beer. And I was telling Sam before we signed on, I'm having it in my, this is a Virginia Tech glass here. I just got this as a birthday gift as well. Uh, It's got Burris Hall on it. It's got Torgerson Bridge. Looks pretty good. Anyway, the beer is awesome. Sam's enjoying his beer, so a successful beer break on our first off-season pod. Cheers, Sam. ACC schedule release. Let's get to what some people really want to hear about because this was fun, and the ACC dragged it out, but that's okay. (laughs) Two days ago, we learned that uh, BC and Florida State were playing each other, and no one cared. Yesterday, we learned about the Thursday and Friday games, which we were involved with, and today – we got the full schedule. If you're watching on YouTube, it's up on your screen. The home slate. I'm just going to read off the home slate. Sam, I'm going to let you react to some of this stuff. We got Marshall, Rutgers, BC on Thursday night, Georgia Tech, Clemson, and UVA. That is the home games. Away games are Vandy, ODU, much to our chagrin, Miami on Friday night, Stanford, Syracuse, and Duke. Go. Let's go to the home games first, Sam. What? Right. What uh like stands out to you? What games are you looking forward to on this on this slate? I mean, Clemson on November 9th, but that's an obvious answer. Um, it feels like Virginia Tech has had a slew of these major home games, and at the you know towards the end of the Beamer era, through the Fuente era, never capitalized really uh, mm-hmm. against when Ohio state Clemson, Notre Dame, when those teams came in, uh, Carolina was really the only one, but that was a fraudulent top 10 win. Let's be honest, I'll be honest about yep. that one. Yep. Um, I don't know how good Clemson's going to be. I have my doubts, but the brand carries so much weight in a November game. That's going to be a big game for the ACC standings. Like I would not be surprised. I don't want to put the, the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse, uh, that's how that goes, right? Yeah, I think you got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that could, that could, I mean, after that tech has an open week, they have at Duke who is going to be a shell of itself as a roster. And then they have UVA at home. That game could decide whether Virginia tech goes to the ACC title game or not. Like that's, that's realistic. And Absolutely. so I, I think that is going to be one on a national scale. And for what it means for Virginia tech football, maybe the biggest home game we've had since Ohio state came is defending national titles, even though Clemson won't be Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence Clemson. I would say it would be the biggest home game since the last time we played Clemson in, uh, well, not the last time, but in 2017, do you remember we were four now and we had Clemson in town? I think game day was there and we, we lost and we didn't embarrass ourselves, but we lost. And, that had a big time feel. And if our season goes the way we think it could go, this Clemson game is massive. And if you look at the schedule, like that's the only team outside of Miami that even has the potential to be ranked 
really. Like, I mean, I know some of these teams could pop into the rankings, but if you think about a ranked opponent for this season, Clemson's our best shot and we get them in lane. So that is, yeah. that is pretty phenomenal. It's really yeah. not a good home slate, to be honest with you. Like Clemson no. is saving the slate. Well, here's the thing, Pete. It's not a good road slate either. So <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what you want the powers that be to do. They, the, they can't make Stanford better at football. I'm sorry. I, here, here's what, what I would say. If we had Clemson and Miami at home on this schedule, that would be a good home slate. I would say that. The fact is they're separated. And so we take, well, finishing out the home stuff, we do get that BC game at home. And so that's mm-hmm. the Thursday night. I think someone said that's the 30 year anniversary of the first Thursday night game in lane. Is that, did you hear I that? Think so. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I would also point out that tech gets one. They finally get home October games. Love those. But there is a stretch three out of four weeks Virginia Tech plays at home. That is a really important stretch. Uh, if Lane yes. Stadium is what Lane Stadium is, that needs to be a big stretch. So having three out of four at home is really clutch because last season it, it did suck around that time of the year. Tech was on the road a lot. So definitely, um, I, I think that'll be that'll that'll be big. Let's go into the away games. Vandy leads it off, and that is going to be. So much fun. I know a lot of our fans are planning to go. I know the Suns are putting together. And when I say the Suns, I'm referring to Pat and Bill because they're handling the organization on this. Uh, I I can't wait. I'm I'm hoping to go. I was thinking about booking a hotel with free cancellation. So if there's a different hotel that the boys book, then I can do that one. But I really want to go. I think the stadium's going to be a ton of Hokies. And no, Vandy's not good, but they did just get Diego piss and Pavia in the fold. <laughs> My child. Oh man. For those who don't know, I am a, well, to be quite honest, I just won a lot of money betting on New Mexico state the past two years. So that's mm-hmm. why I love them so much. Uh, Diego Pavia is a ton of fun. T- Vanderbilt is awful. They are terrible. Um, there are, they're an awful offensive team and they're somehow a worse defensive team. That should be a tech should have absolutely no problem. I think it might be the worst team on their schedule. I don't understand. Like if you look at their recruiting rankings and, you know, talent composites and things like that, Vandy shouldn't be that bad, but they were awful last year. Really awful. Getting a quarterback will help. I mean, yep. he he's a, he's a very good quarterback. And I called him piss and Pavia because he was known last year for peeing on the New Mexico logo. Uh, yeah. during the rivalry week or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a gamer. Uh, he is. He's, <laughs> he's like, got that dog in him. <laughs> he's, he's got something in him. <laughs> he's Southwest Johnny Manziel. And he's yeah. really fun. He, play, he plays so hard, man. He really does. Uh, so if you get a chance to watch Vanderbilt, at least watch for Diego Pavia. He deserves it. He is college football encapsulated. So then we got ODU on the road again. We thought we might be getting out of this. There were some whispers on Twitter, not even whispers. There were straight up tweets that went out about the potential cancellation of the ODU series, but apparently an agreement couldn't be met. And now we have this official schedule. Yeah, really weird. And and this was not hokey Twitter rumors or anything. This was from old Dominion camps as well. Really Mm well-respected people who are, plugged into the program so from what i have heard from plugged in people uh sons of sources the acc is looking very heavily at moving to a nine game schedule a conference schedule next season which makes sense Mm -hmm. because there's like 30 teams in the conference now (laughs) so that makes sense it it has not been officially announced and part of that means you got to get rid of one of your non-conference and for virginia tech I'll, I'll be honest too. There are people in the old Dominion program shocked that this was ever a contract, that that this ever happened, and so I think Tech I was and, shocked, Sam. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, so Virginia Tech was, should not be playing in a twenty-two thousand seat stadium. It just it shouldn't. Should. Ha- I don't care that it's in a seven five seven, and and the the bogus claim that it helps recruiting. It doesn't help recruiting when you go there and get your butt kicked. That doesn't help recruiting. And so I, I've, I, it never made sense to me. I understand there were 
financial implications and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But so that's, this, that's just my sidebar. <laughs> this was the one on the chopping block. And it, from what it seems like is since the ACC has not publicly announced and, and confirmed a nine game schedule for next season, that Virginia Tech didn't feel totally comfortable completely buying out the schedule mm-hmm. um, or didn't want to pay for it whichever one that may be, probably a mixture of both. So Virginia Tech will uh, play about 20 minutes down the road for me at Norfolk. Uh, against and you know what, Dominion. Sam? It Part of me is a little bit happy it didn't get canceled because I want to go there and I want to win and I want to win definitively and then cancel the series. <laughs> that's that's kind of how I want it to play out. Well, I'm wondering if the ACC moves to nine games, if the ACC would have to pay partially for the cancellation of, of the contract. I, I am not a lawyer, um, <laughs> you know, but, but you would think that one of our my P5 guess is they might be holding cut first because you're adding a P5 game. So you really should subtract, subtract a P5 game. And we have played, we played two P5s out of conference last year and we got two this year. Although Vandy is <laughs> yeah. it's, and I guess now it's P4 too. So I can't P5 is wrong as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Miami is also on the road on a Friday night. There was a little bit of chit chat back and forth. I think Billy and Tim Thomas were going at it on Twitter about whether this is good or bad. Uh, Tim was of the opinion that it's a old school rivalry with two brands that are well known to dislike each other and have played a lot of classic games. It should be on a Saturday. And a lot of people also felt on the other side of that, that, Hey, it's a Friday night national TV spot. And I've never been a huge fan of Friday night games, but I fall into that camp of like, if you can be the only good game on, you want to be the only good game on. Yeah. And I think it's well one of those two where the ACC needed to put its brands up on a pedestal. And to be honest, September 27th, even if both of these teams are 4-0 at that point, this was never going to be an ABC 330 game. This was never going to be the noon ESPN game. This was never going to be a night game. Like it, it just, if you look at the schedule across the country, it wasn't going to overtake some of the bigger SEC and Big Ten games. So they did this to put their teams on a pedestal. These are two of their bigger brands. People are going to both have a chance to start off really well, as you said. Yeah. So I, I think they made the right move doing this. It is unfortunate, however, the game that comes after it. Yeah, because from a logistical do a, standpoint. And this is the toughest stretch. If you're looking for what's the toughest stretch of the season, for me, it's just this back-to-back with going to Miami and then going all the way to the other side of the country and playing Stanford. They literally took the two farthest schools from each other and put them back-to-back for Virginia Tech on the road. If we can get through this and this is at the end of a six game stretch of games week after week after week to start the season we have our bye week right after stanford thank god but that's really tough and so is stanford a schedule loss it it may end up being that way um it kind of depends on what happens at miami and how that all plays out at least miami is on that friday because you get an extra day to get back and then travel again do you know how far Virginia Tech is going to have to fly when they go from Blacksburg to Miami, back to Blacksburg, to Palo Alto, back to Blacksburg? Do I have any do gauge? not know, but you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> oh, I am. It's over 6,000 miles. 6,130 Oof. flight miles. That's like Virginia Tech playing a game in Astana, which is the capital of Kazakhstan. <laughs> I, yeah, it's it is, in one week, eight their, days. I did my thesis on college sports and and travel and the impact of that financially and on the student athletes, things like that. And this is a nightmare scenario. I mean, this, this is a nightmare scenario logistically, not only for the, the, not only financially, but also what it does to the student athletes. Like they're not playing school that week. They're going to be in the airport most of the time. I mean, that's yeah forget even forget the student athlete for most football season i guess and that that's how it's always kind of been but this is absurd and the fact that the matter is back to back road games in general even if we were playing duke and then wake back to back the the statistical likelihood of you winning that second game is so low it, it like back to backs are brutal like uh, roadies 
and that's what this is. And they're the it's the furthest two roadies you could you could get. And so uh, unless it was Cal back to Tech and then back to Stanford, that's the only way it could be worse. But uh, it's pretty bad, and they did us dirty right there. The rest of it, from an overall standpoint, I think shakes out pretty well. You talked about those three out of four home games. Those are sandwiched between two buys. We have two by every team has two buys in the conference. Some have mm-hmm. three because Georgia Tech and Florida State are playing in oh, week, week zero. zero. So they, get, yep. they get three. But the two by sandwiching, we have to play well during that four game stretch. Like mm-hmm. everything should be set up for you to be rest and like ready for Boston College. And then even between Boston College and GT, you get two extra days because BC is mm-hmm. on Thursday night. I, I think that's huge. That was what people were fearing going into this schedule is what was going to be a Georgia Tech's going to be a good team. We had a feeling that one of either Boston College or Georgia Tech was going to be a Thursday night game. So it was what sandwiching around that. I think they got lucky. Open date before the Thursday night game. That's good. And then getting an extra couple days of rest before Georgia Tech at Syracuse before Clemson is just a <laughs> recipe for failure. But it is. At but, least it's by itself, though. <laughs> yes, and I, I, and I think, I think that's that scares the fans more than the players. Like I don't, Kyron Drones doesn't know that Virginia Tech has played poorly against Syracuse in the '90s in the Carrier Dome, right? Like he doesn't know. Like they don't care. We care. Pete, you and I yeah. care. They don't care. So let's let's keep that in mind. I think this is as manageable of a schedule as you could possibly imagine. The the road trip Miami and Stanford is um, unfortunate from a non football standpoint. I think more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're like, listen, if you, if we go down and we beat Miami and then lose to Stanford, or the opposite, right? That may be okay. Like that because yeah. you're you are going to th- as as weak as this schedule may look on paper in terms of just the quality of the teams on the schedule. There's going to be losses. And so is that a schedule loss? I talked about it last year when we had to go to Marshall after playing Purdue and Rutgers and how that was a schedule loss. Now we could have won that game, but we didn't. And I don't think the fact of going up to New Jersey and then going to Marshall the very next week did us any favors. Mm -hmm. And so that stretch is tough, but the double buys I think work out well. I think they're placed pretty well to get the buy before Duke and UVA to kind of one final health tune up and like feel mm-hmm. good before those two games that even though Manny Diaz is coming in, it's not the Mike Elko team. There's a lot of change happening. Duke should be beatable and we know UVA is beatable. So it gives us a chance to have a buy and focus and get ready for those two final games to maybe put an exclamation point on what could be a very good season. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, tech ends the game with three home games, right? Clemson at Duke and UVA. Those are three home games. Like that's, <laughs> that's, funny. that's yeah. I, I, I mean that s- somewhat joking, but we fill those stadiums. We do. That's, that's a tech home game. And, and you know, I, I think Vanderbilt's going to be a tech home game because of the change from Nissan stadium to Vanderbilt stadium. And the way the ticketing contract went, it's going to be pretty much all Virginia tech fans. So you're so. saying we got nine home games. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Uh, I, I don't think, I think there are really two games on this schedule where Virginia tech is not the more talented team. And I don't even know about, we'll get into, I'm getting way above myself. This game's not until November, but like (laughs) this isn't, this isn't the Clemson from when I was back in school like this. So I think it's going to be tricky. It's going to test Brent Pry again. Let's remember this program has struggled to get ready for road games. I think yep. that is probably my biggest fear with that Stanford. I mean, Stanford's not a good team. They're absolutely horrible. Uh, in, in my little nerdy model thing, they were second to last in the country and adjusted EPA. Um, they're not good. Like Vanderbilt was better. Like they're not good. <laughs> yeah. um, Did you see you know, who? Are you talking about out of conference now? Are we just finishing off this out of conference thought? <laughs> yeah, let's finish that one. Um, we haven't because, talked about Marshall. Yeah. Did you know who their Marshall. quarterback is? Marshalls, um, who they brought in in the portal. I can't believe I don't know this. I just checked it because I forgot. And today it's Mitch Griffiths. Oh, golly. (laughs) Yeah. The guy, the the quarterback. 
that oh, we played man. against like oh, Wake. Funny. He played for Wake. Mitch Griffiths did, and I think, but didn't we see like two or three quarterbacks when we played Wake? I saw three. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's um, what I. That's what I thought. He's not good, and but Cam Francher was managed to beat us last year. But we're getting Marshall at home this season. It 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 should be, should be a win. And then Rutgers, a lot of their teams coming back. I, I from what mm-hmm. I understand. Um, but they still brought in a quarterback in the portal as well. They brought in that uh, Kakalaki quarterback from from Minnesota. He has like that long that long last name that starts with a K. But Wimsat is not a good actual quarterback. He can run a bit, but uh, and he and he hurt us with his legs. But like the quarterbacks in- that are playing for these out of conference teams, other than Diego pa- Pavia, are not very good. No, and I would say you would think with the pieces returning on defense for Virginia Tech in the lockdown corners, you would expect Virginia Tech to be able to play the style of defense that really worked for them last year, which was just man let Mansoor Delane and Dorian Strong do their work, stack the box, yeah. make quarterbacks throw against you. Um, I just don't see a quarterback – like. Klubnik can hurt you. Cam Ward at Miami, maybe, but in the non-conference, man, there's a tech should these should be pretty low scoring games for the tech defense. I agree. I did want to talk to you a little bit about well, we we could talk about how you think those first four games are gonna go and, and going into that Miami game. Maybe this is a better conversation for later in the offseason, but like people are talking four and oh, like the possibility is there. Uh, it, it's it's favorable up front. And if we were to do that, this hype and the feeling around the program would just go to a different level. Yeah, I, I mean, Miami is matchup-wise very tough. Like, Miami is good at what Virginia Tech was poor at last year. They're a very, very good team on the line of scrimmage. And Virginia Tech struggled on the line of scrimmage last year. Now, does Tech get better? Probably, but do they get better enough? And I, I don't want our offs. I'm very excited, obviously, but I don't want our offseason discussion to be clouded by how Tech played against Virginia and Tulane. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because this is a team that struggled mightily on the offensive line for over half the season. The linebacker core was really questionable. The interior defensive line, who lost a lot of players, very questionable. Um, so there's they got some work to do in order to reach this hype. That's for sure. No doubt about it, but going four and is not going to help, and that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> no, I want I, the, the Michael Scott line. I am ready to be heard again. Yeah, that's right. But, that's right. But man, but, I'm, I'm really excited. This is a. It's going to be a fun schedule. I mean, playing at Stanford. Who would have thought? Yeah, I know. We didn't that's even a, talk about the at Stanford game, October fifth. That's a big one that people are scheduling, and uh, I've been to that stadium. I saw them play UCLA there many years ago, and it, from a student engagement standpoint like they're there to tailgate some of them it's not a ton but some of their students go and tailgate but they do not give a crap about the game like not at all and so you it's not a hostile environment it's just a far away environment yeah uh i i can just imagine myself now sitting in napa valley after a little wine tour with a nice charcuterie board (laughs) and you might have to you might have to drag me to, to the stadium because that's have you been nice. out to wine country in the past have i have not there? not as an adult okay uh, okay i've been to texas wine country which is not at all <laughs> like don't let them fool you it's not texas wine country that I feel like there's a joke about uh Shinerbach in there somewhere. Like it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't sound like real wine country at all. I'd recommend the Shinerbach over the Texas wine. Yeah. Uh, right. I went two summers ago, me and my wife did a little, a little wine country jaunt. We rented a car and drove all around and we had an absolute blast even stopped in Palo Alto. Cause I got a friend that lives there. Uh, my friend Adam lives out there. So I may end up going and staying with him and going to the game, but a lot of Hokies are talking about making that trip. And it, and it is like, especially for our California Hokies that, you know, live all up and down that coast. That's exciting. They can mm-hmm. obtain tickets easily and, and enjoy the game. Yeah. I don't understand the people who look, we've talked about the logistics of it for the team, but as fans, like 
what's the difference between hopping on a flight to Boston and hopping on a flight to San Francisco? Like a couple hours, you know, you're going to be fine. Yeah. A little bit of jet it's, lag, a couple more hours on the plane. It's all right. <laughs> you're fine. Do you want to end it? I, I found Doug Bowman's tweet. Do we want to end it with that? Yeah. Well, I, I want to end it. Well, we can talk about Doug Bowman's tweet and then I want to just notable games around the conference and then we'll call it it's just a few more okay. minutes here. Okay. Uh, real quick, Doug Bowman's tweet. Uh, did some did some math on Bill Connolly's formula, and he said Virginia Tech's offense is returning 89.94% of the offense. That would have been second highest in FBS this year. And returning 76.1% of the defense, that would have been 22nd. Total returning production, 83%. And so, I, I mean, that's, that's a very, very high number. I, I think it just goes to show this roster retention was – miraculous by this staff oh yeah i mean it and it felt that way but hearing those numbers really puts it in in really good context and exciting context let me add the matrix that the acc put out today with all the Let's games go. This, is, this is gonna be a little tough for you to see uh on the on the right end there it's all blocked off by our logo but that's okay i wanted to talk about some of the notable games around the conference I'm going to start with the Florida State and Georgia Tech game in Ireland. That was the game that Navy and Notre Dame played last year. This will probably be an equally not close game. <laughs> I would expect Florida State to kick some butt. But the idea of like Florida State and Georgia Tech fans being in Ireland just kind of cracks me up a little bit. <laughs> it's uh, quite the uh, dichotomy right there. So week one, there are a bunch of Interesting games. We've got Clemson against Georgia in Atlanta, Miami at Florida, UNC at Minnesota. That is just weird, like really weird out of conference home and home. And then mm -hmm. Stanford hosts TCU in week one. Mm -hmm. TCU actually plays a couple of these teams because, you know, they have their matchup with SMU uh, later in the year. And then NC State against Tennessee in week two. That is that's a good game. You've talked about how you think NC State could be for real next year. Yeah, NC State has done exceptional in the portal. Now, they do lose a lot of their team leadership from last year, and I don't think they were nearly as good as their record was last year, but they're bringing in a lot of really talented people. They got Grace McCall, who has been in college for eight years now. Yeah, right. Um, I, I think they're going to be a really good team. They have a really interesting schedule. Like they have some cupcakes on there, like Western Carolina, La Tech, NIU, Wake Forest, Cal, Stanford, who knows what's going to be a Duke. Like NC State might mediocre their way to a 10 and 2 season. And I mean, it's a two game schedule in a it, long time. It really is. It's that Tennessee game and then it's at Clemson. And otherwise, yeah, you could say going to UNC in a rivalry game is that's a tough game but they own unc like they they do really yeah. well against unc so yes this could be another year where nc state's record at the end of the year is better than the actual like power ranking per se of them cal at auburn is week two you'll remember auburn went to cal last year and it was actually a pretty tight game like mm -hmm. the cal gave them a run for their money but that's that's our new member cal if you want to go talk about smu smu if you look sam they only got 11 games on their schedule right now <laughs> they they need another game there's four there's four buys on there if i'm not mistaken um, um there are four but there yeah um i am counting the grid right yeah now, no it's, yeah, it's 11 do. and their that's, first SMU is really going to be really interesting <laughs> I'm excited to see the Mustangs play, and I'm excited to bet against them, I think. Yeah, That's their first thing. ACC game is hosting Florida State. Uh, so that yeah. that's kind of fun, uh, the fact that they get Florida State at home. For them, that's on 929. Florida State is also Cal's first ACC game, but that one is in Tallahassee. So they're welcoming those two teams uh, <laughs> the best way they know how. Um, for Cal's first ACC home game, is Miami Stanford's first ACC home game is us is Virginia tech. We are the first ACC game period that they will play. Yeah. And I, I want to point out two two little stretches here. One, we'll, we'll talk Stanford. They, we talk about our trip. They have to play at Syracuse and then play at Clemson. 
and then they play. Yeah, Virginia are they Tech. just going to stay on the East Coast for a week or something? Not allowed to. You have really? only Hawaii. Hawaii is the only program, and it's only for certain sports that they're allowed to stay over the week and not return mm. to campus. You have to return to campus. So Stanford has to go to Syracuse, go back to Palo Alto, go to Clemson, go back to Palo Alto. Then they host Virginia Tech, and then they travel to Notre Dame. That's rough, man. That that's rough. really that's brutal. But I think the most brutal stretch is for Clemson towards the end of the season. After their bye week, they host Louisville, very good Louisville team, travel to Virginia Tech, and then have to travel to Pittsburgh in the cold. I think that's the toughest three-game ACC stretch. And that pick me, game could definitely be a loss. <laughs> I, I I, mean, there is, there is a world where Clemson gets trounced by Georgia, wins all the way through, loses at Florida State, and then that three-game series could be very, very important for Dallas. I mean, Louisville, you know Louisville's going to be good, and we're going to be pretty good. And so, like, if they— And I never want to be in Pittsburgh in mid-November. No. That's a terrible no. place to play. As a Southern team going to Pittsburgh in mid-November, you do not want that. And so that I did not notice that, Sam, and it wasn't on my list, but that's, that's a good it's, eye there. Yeah. Florida yeah. State hosts Clemson. This is always a key game in the ACC on 10-5. Early game for that matchup. And it was early this year as well. Florida State and Louisville, a rematch of last year's ACC title game, not happening. They do not play this year. Uh, Miami hosts Florida State on 10-26. That's always a classic in the ACC. And then Notre Dame, their five games against the ACC. We get Louisville and Notre Dame, who just played last year. And Louisville um, beat them up pretty good. That's on 9 28 and that's in South Bend. Florida State is also going to South Bend 11-9, the same day that we play Clemson. And then the other three games for, for Notre Dame are GT, Stanford, and UVA. So they got three very winnable games, and you you mentioned how Stanford is after a brutal trip. Um, but they do face two of our better teams in Louisville and Florida State, but they're both at home. So like it works out well for Notre Dame. <laughs> In Notre Dame, uh, their crowd is really interesting at Notre Dame games. Not a classic college football crowd, but they are one of the best home teams in the country uh, just in terms of how much they win at home. Uh, they, they, they rarely yes. lose at Notre Dame Stadium. So, And, and also talk about a place that you don't want to go late in the season. Oh, my God. Uh, so I, I really think Notre Dame, the way their schedule sets up, they have a chance to make the playoff. Uh, Riley, yeah, getting Florida State there. to come up there in from Tallahassee eleven nine. Do you remember? Did you go to the twenty sixteen game? The yes, one, um, I went to there? both games at Notre Dame. Okay, I went the to the first weather. one. Oh my god, the first one was like this date uh, eleven nine, eleven four, something like that. It was so freaking cold. Like, like that is not a good situation for Florida State, like at all. So it's that it's not going to be, and I'm going to, I'm going to be really interested to see how Florida state handles that four game stretch because it, you know, at Duke after a bye week, we'll see what they look like after a bye, but then you got to go at Miami, you got Carolina, you got at Notre Dame. If this is the team that wants to make the playoff, uh, that's going to be a really key stretch yeah, after man. that Clemson game. Yeah. Yeah. And they got to go. This is going to be fun. This is going to yeah. be fun. I throwing throwing Cal and Stanford and SMU into the mix just makes the ACC that much more go ACC with so much more wacky potential. Um, the big game as the as it's known, the big game, mm -hmm. Cal hosts Stanford as an ACC game on 11 23. And I felt like I just needed to mention it because it is a classic rivalry and now it's a, a storied ACC rivalry. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If you're going to play Cal, you better bring your run defense. Jaden Knott, one of the best running backs in the country. Cal can put up some points. They have a high tempo offense. It's going to, they might catch some people by surprise. Yeah. No, they, they really might. They, they were feisty last year for a good portion of the season. Uh, but that's going to do it for the podcast. We covered a lot of ground. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed our schedule breakdown. That was, that was really the big news. But, little bit of updates here and there and that's what me and sam are going to do throughout the winter and into the spring as we lead up to spring ball and everything basketball coverage will be happening throughout february and throughout march with both teams uh and like i said 
Rob will be in and out of the podcast, but we're going to have Sam here to, to help pick up the slack. And it's going to be a great off season leading up into season 10. So thank you for being here, bud. I, I do, do very much appreciate it. And Hey, for all the people that were complaining about Robbie drinking non-alcoholic beers, Sam is drinking alcoholic beers. <laughs> I, I will <laughs> promise you, Pete. Well, first off, don't shame non-alcoholic beers. Second, um, no, I will. I, I love them myself when they have their place. <laughs> I I will always be drinking alcoholic beer, and I will <laughs> I'll try to have a different one all the time. I think yeah. that's going to be a goal for me is is to have some fun ones. So, you uh, got to find I'll, I'll a score that allows you to make your own sixer. That's, mm. that's the key because that's what I, I would stock up. I'd go, I'd get 12 different beers. So whenever I had a podcast, I could at least pull a different one. Of course there, there were repeats over the years and somewhere Rob has the database of like the 500 beers that we drank on the podcast, but um, it's going to be fun. And until next time, when we're talking a little basketball and probably a little football update, go Hokies. Go Hokies. <laughs>